Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Once again, the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. The more you know about the Word of God, the better you are going to be to understand God's New Testament revelation because the Old Testament lays the foundation. So what we're doing, we're in our midst of our study of the epistle to the Hebrews, and now we're ready for chapter 10. And notice how he begins once more. Chapter 10 and verse 1. We read here, For the law, over and over we've seen how he's emphasized the law as the paradigm for understanding New Testament truth more particularly understanding the person, the work, the ministry of Messiah Yeshua. You can't ignore this book. He is trying to bless you, the writer of this. He is trying to tell you what you need to study in order to come to a better understanding of New Testament revelation, what the Redeemer has done and how it's supposed to impact your life now in this present age and what you do in response to that is going to impact your eternity. Verse 1, chapter 10. For the law having a shadow. Now, here again, we see that a shadow is a form of something else. A real representation, but a weaker representation. It's not the truth, but it simply is an outcome of it. So, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things that were coming. But it says, not the very image of those things. Now, we need to pay attention to that word, those things. Because the word things, well, in the Greek language, it is the word pragmatic, where we get that English word. And what he's saying here, see, the word pragmatic is very powerful. Because pragmatic means this, I come to this decision because it makes sense, it's logical. And in that same way, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is this, when we understand the law and the shadow that it casts of future things, what future things? Kingdom things. Messiah's ministry, which is a kingdom ministry. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So once we understand the shadow, we're better able to understand the substance that casts that shadow. So he says, the law having a shadow of good things that were coming, but not the very image of those things. For each year, these sacrifices, which were offered for, what does he say? For a continuality, meaning this. These sacrifices that were offered up according to the Torah, they were ongoing. They were daily or yearly, depending upon the sacrifices. And what is he trying to say here? He's trying to say that they were not sufficient. Because they had to be repeated over and over, it stands to reason. If you have to do something over and over, it wears out. It is not uh, sufficient. It is not achieving perfection. That's what he's revealing here. For they were not able, and the word here for not able is never, ever able to do something. They were not able to do something. To bring the one who was coming here, the one who was offering them, the one who was coming to the altar, it was not able to make them perfect. Now, this word appears in different forms, oftentimes translated in different words, but it's the word for perfection. And what we learn going back to Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 11, we are already taught by the writer of Hebrews 
that the law never could bring about perfection. And you know what? The law was never intended to bring about perfection. The law was to outline, to describe, to give us a paradigm for understanding how perfe perfe perfection would be established. What would have to be done for that perfection to come? And there's a relationship between this word perfection and the kingdom of God. So look now to verse 2. Since there would not be a ceasing of those offerings because they were not having the, the what we could say, the ability to bring the conscience of sin, bring it to a change, bring a conscience to, of sin, those who were offering up. So what happens? Well, this is what he's saying. Based upon those Old Testament sacrifices done at the tabernacle, done at the temple, they were done continuously. Why? Because they could not bring an end to the consciousness of sin. If they could, there would be no longer a reason to offer them up. So the fact that they were commanded to be done year after year, oftentimes day after day, shows their insufficiency. They were not able to bring about a, a consciousness of sin for those who were what? Offering up. It didn't bring a change to them. Once they were what? Once they had been cleansed. But in these sacrifices, what does he say? The next word, they are a reminder of sins each year. So once more, he's talking about the significance of Yom Kippur. Throughout this section, Yom Kippur is the framework, the holiday that is given to us to understand the context to be able to interpret this passage correctly. And what he's saying is this, if these sacrifices could do away with the consciousness of sin, that is the guilt of sin, people wouldn't make them anymore. They wouldn't remember to do them. But because the presence, the consciousness of sin, that guilt, that we are an unclean, unrighteous people, they would come year after year for Yom Kippur to make the various sacrifices that the high priest made on that day. Verse 4, what he's already said, he wants to repeat it again. For impossible is the blood of bulls and goats to bring about the removal, the taking away, the remission of sin. So, very bold here, and he gives proof from the Torah. If the blood of these goats and bulls, if they were able to take away sin, our sinful nature, remove the consequences of sin from us eternally, then what? then we wouldn't have to continue to make them, but we do under the Old Testament law. Verse 5, Therefore, the one who would enter into this world says, and it's speaking about Messiah, he came with a proclamation. He came with a calling on his life. So we've just seen in the first few verses of chapter 10 how the inadequacy, the insufficiency of the Torah law does that mean it has no relevance today? It certainly does not mean that. It is a teaching tool, and you know what? It always was. It was to impact how we think so there would be a change in behavior as well. But now we're foreshadowing something here in this book, something greater that had already happened, but the Torah foreshadowed it. And now we're dealing with the reality of what the Torah, that shadow that it casts. So look with me to the next verse where we left off, look if you would, to, to verse 5. Therefore, he entered into this world saying, sacrifice and offerings you did not want. Now, God is speaking through his son, Messiah. And what's the word? That God did not want sacrifice and offerings. That was not the key desire of God. But what, it, what was it? But, meaning in contrast to these sacrifices and offerings, it says, but a body that has been prepared for me. So Messiah, 
He is sent into this world with the proclamation that God does not want sacrifices and offerings, in the plural, ongoing day after day, year after year, but He wants a body that is prepared by Him, for Him, in this world. So it's foreshadowing the work of Messiah. Look now to, to verse, verse 6. It says here, Therefore, Let's go back to verse 5 and read that. Therefore he entered into this world saying, Sacrifice and offerings you did not want, but a body which has been prepared uh, uh, for me. If burnt offerings and sacrifices or offerings for sins were, were not pleasing, they're not pleasing to him. He says, Therefore he says, Behold, I come in the head of the book, for it's been write, written of me. Now, this word for head, maybe in your Bible it's translated volume or something else. But in the Greek language, this word is composed of the word head. It means the chief thing, the primary thing. So when we read the scripture, and that's what it talks about here when it uses the word book, literally it's where we get the English word Bible from. It's the Greek word biblion, Bible. And it's saying in this passage, that the, the chief thing, the head thing, the primary message of the Bible is on him. So, in this scripture, it's been written about me. And what is he supposed to do? It says, to do the will of God. So, Messiah, if we read the scripture properly, we understand that there is one that is sent into this world saying, sacrifices, in the plural, offerings, are not what God desires. He desires something else. And that is, in order to bring about the kingdom, a body has to be prepared for him by Messiah. And we read here, verse, verse 8, he says, Above all, saying that sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifice concerning sin you did not want. He says, literally, nor are you pleased with these, which according to the Torah, they have been offered. Verse 9. Then he says, Behold, I come to do the will of my, my God, to do the will of God, taking away the first in order that the second should stand. Now, this is an important statement. Messiah comes in order that the first might be done away with. And what is that? Well, notice it's in the present. It doesn't say he take, took it away, but he's taking it away. And we know that in the future, the law will be done away with. When will it be done away with? Well, the scripture says, and Messiah is speaking, when there's a new heaven and new earth because this first heaven and this first earth, that this creation has been done away with. When is that? In the new Jerusalem. So we need to be very careful and not mistranslate things or reach improper conclusions. We read in this passage that he's coming, middle of verse 9, to do the will of God, to do your will, O God, and taking away the first in order that the second should stand. Look at verse 10. In which there's a desire, there's a desire, for we who are being sanctified through offerings of what? Well, not offerings, but of the offering of the body of Messiah. And then it says, once. We cannot ignore what the scripture is saying. That the Old Testament offerings and sacrifices give us a paradigm, a way of understanding more excellently the work of Messiah. What God wanted, ultimately, was the body of His Son being prepared for Him in order that one time, once and for all, He should be offered up. That's what He says here is His will. Verse 11, For every priest stands each day serving, and those sacrifices they are offered up frequently, which were never able to do what? To take away sin. Now, he's just repeating himself. Why? 
Well, to show us, if we rely upon the Torah and we think that is sufficient for us to become a kingdom people, we are sadly mistaken. We find in this passage that these things were never able to deal with the problem of sin sufficiently, completely, eternally. No, who's going to do that? Messiah Yeshua. Because as he is of a more excellent priesthood, and his offering once and for all was his blood. It was all sufficient. Verse, verse 11, For every priest he stood each day serving, and those same, meaning those same sacrifices frequently he was offering up, which were never able to, to take away, to lift up from us sin in a sufficient manner. Verse 12, but this one, in behalf of sin, he offered up one sacrifice, and he did so, and here's the key. There's a very important Greek word, and in English, the best way to translate it is the word perpetuality. It means something that has a perpetual characteristic to it. What's another simpler way to say that? Eternal. So what Messiah did, it was once and for all. It has a perpetual characteristic to it. And this word here in the Greek word language means something that continues, and here's the key, without the ability to be changed. So what are we learning? Well, if Messiah's sacrifice has eternal consequences and his sacrifice bought for us freely, free to us, he paid it, brought for us eternal life, eternal redemption. As we've said a few weeks ago and a few weeks before that, we can be secured in our salvation experience. We don't have to live in fear, but you know what we have? We have assurance. Don't underestimate the power of having assurance, knowing for sure that we are eternally secure in the sufficiency of Messiah's sacrifice, his perfect work. And it's the resurrection that testifies to this, that God received it, that he said yes to what Messiah did. And that's what the scripture is telling us. And that's why it is so problematic when people teach falsely about, well, you can lose your salvation. And I've said this before, and I want to say it again. When people say, you know, if you believe in an eternal salvation experience by grace through faith, what you're doing is that you're giving people a license to sin. No way. Because true believers, the whole motivation, the reason why they came to faith, the reason why they are committed to Messiah is because they don't want to live in sin. So when someone hears, you mean... I'm saved forever, and nothing I can ever do will change that? Yes, that's true. Good, now I'm going to go out and live a sinful life. That's not the attitude of believer. A true believer knows sin just brings dreadful problems into your life and others. If you are walking in love, you're not going to want to sin because you know sin has disastrous consequences for the innocent, for other people. Not just for you, but it affects others so my assurance of salvation encourages me it spurs me on to what to love to obey to behave in a way that is pleasing to him that's what that doctrine produces in a believer's life look now if you would again to verse 12 for this one in behalf of sin was offered up a sacrifice one time for this perpetu you, uh, perpetuality is what it says here, perpetuality. So he did that once and for all. And after that, notice what it says at the end of, of verse, verse 12. Afterwards, he sat down at the right hand of God. And at the end, those who are waiting until, until he sets, now he here is God. He's waiting until the end, until 
he sets the enemies his enemies underneath the footstool of his feet so by his victory another important truth that he's making a point here is by his sufficient work it destroys the enemies of God those people and those uh, entities both in this world and in the spiritual domain that are against the purposes and plans of God they're all going to be done away with and it's the power of the sufficiency of Messiah's death that is going to bring that about that has caused him to be the ruler of a kingdom of righteousness see we should be excited about this move on now to verse 14 he says for one sacrifice he has made perfect and this tense of this word for perfect is this it's become perfect in the past it's perfect now today and it will be perfect on into the future that one sacrifice was complete for perfection to be obtained and we read here he look at verse 14 for we read for the the sharpening we could say of those ones he has has sanctified so these things have a purpose in order to bring for permanency sharpen them and make them right forever and ever those who are being sanctified verse 15 for he testified by means of the holy spirit to us for after it was said beforehand and that sounds kind of silly does it not after which was said beforehand and it simply means this after he did his work he reminded us the scripture did of what was said beforehand and what does that consist of well good news good news that we're going to encounter next week when he speaks about this new covenant now here's a point that we need to understand it is only when we rightly perceive the new covenant that we can understand what God expects from us that we can perceive properly the call that we have on our life a covenant a covenant is an agreement and within that covenant and don't miss this there are expectations God has expectations for his people that shouldn't surprise you I mean, you don't have to read very much in the Scripture, in the New Testament, to realize that you have a call on your life. Ministry. Now, ministry comes from a word that has to do with service, but service unto God. A service is related to a servant. And therefore, we're supposed to be people understanding covenantal expectations that God has placed upon his people not to save us but because we are his saved people we have been redeemed and now we belong to him and that relationship ought to manifest itself in our life in the things that we say the decisions we make and the things that we do every aspect of the being that's what he's going to begin to reveal when we study this new covenant now the word new here is an important word because new biblically speaking is related to change so when you accept the new covenant that was established by the blood of messiah that was shed on passover the festival of redemption there ought to be change radical change that comes into your life and if that's not the case well there's a problem and the problem's not with the truth of God, but how you are applying the truth of God to your life. So he's going to be speaking about the new covenant. And let me just say to you that this new covenant, we're going to see without any doubt that there are some similarities between the old covenant, and I'm speaking about the law of Moses, and the new covenant. See, you ask most believers, do you think there's similarities? This, oh, that's all done away with, that's in the past. There's nothing in regard to this new relationship with Messiah that's connected to the old. That's false. We're going to see it in an undeniable way next week when we examine briefly this new covenant. And this new covenant, it was established by death because all covenants 
have to be brought about by death. Why? Because they're ratified with blood. That is, they're put into effect by the means of blood being placed upon that, that document and also, from a biblical standpoint, upon the individual. So it's going to get exciting about what God's going to reveal. And notice, go back up to, to verse, verse 14. What we're finding here is that he's revealing these things, literally verse 15, by means of who? By means of the Holy Spirit. And whenever there's a reference to the Holy Spirit, we ought to think about order. The order of God being imposed upon the person. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's mentioned here right before he speaks about this new covenant because the Holy Spirit, his anointing, his power in your life, his provision to you is so that this new covenant expectations can be manifested in your life. So let me ask a question. Are you interested in God's expectations? Do you pray for them? Do you seek them? Do you desire them? Because if you do not, and all that you're concerned with is your expectations, making them known to God, well, you know what's happening? Instead of being in a spiritual warfare against the enemy, you know what you are? You are participating with the enemy. Because all those desires that you have, where did they originate from? Your own mind. And who put them there? The enemy did. You see, the truth of God, the purposes of God, they never originate with man, they originate with God. And therefore, they have to be revealed to us. And what is the instrument that receives them? Your heart. But here's the key. People talk about, God wants to give me the desires of my heart. Well, that's true if you understand the condition of the heart. God wants to give you the desires of a established heart. That is a word Lave heart, nachon. The word nachon, established, but you know what it means in modern Hebrew? Correct. It is only when your heart has been corrected by the Holy Spirit. Then your desires are going to be God's desires because he's placed them there. And that's what you're going to be praying for. That's what you're going to be passionate for. And that is what your life, every aspect of it, is going to reflect and as you pursue that, you are going to deepen in your intimacy, your relationship with God. And the outcome of that relationship is going to be a joy that passes all understanding. Well, once again, my time is up until next week. And we continue on in Hebrews in chapter 10. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.